this session and immediately open the next one and I pass the mic to the next chairman, Professor Bobesky. So let us start this second session. The first speaker for the second session, Professor Wolfgang Schleich from the uh, University of Ulm. And uh, Wolfgang Schleich will speak about the vacuum. Can we move this? Because I don't need to. Right, I'll do it on the black. Perfect. Where do you need that? I have no Okay, fine. Can you hear me? Can you, the, uh, so let me get started by thanking the organizers uh, for making not only this meeting possible, but also for giving me a chance to be here and say thanks to Ivo, to Sophie, to Ivana for many years of friendship. And I will tell you in a minute how we met and how all this started. Uh, and I hope that the distinguished chairman will give me a few extra minutes for that. <laughs> nice try, right? <laughs> so again, I'm asking if you can hear me, and i tell you a funny story. When I was at the Max Planck, and I, I know uh, he was also at the Max Planck at the time, I was a young privat at him, and Professor Walter, the director of the institute, he was a very busy man running from conference to conference. Sometimes we were giving talks at the same conference, and he would never listen to my talk. But then when he retired, he had a little bit more time, and he would listen to my talks. And he would come later on and say, hey, Schleich, I really liked your talk. I said, so you like the physics? He said, it has nothing to do with the physics, but you have such a loud voice, I can always hear what you say. <laughs> so I, I hope you can hear me. And I have to say, I met Ivo in exactly 40 years ago at a summer school in Boulder, Colorado, organized by Azim Barut, and I remember the Kajik was there. And I was very impressed because no matter who spoke, no matter what the topic was, this gentleman from Poland could always say something. And he would always point his finger at something that wasn't quite right or one had to understand or something new was coming out. So I thought, that's a very interesting man. And when I was hired as a young professor in 91 in Ulm at the university there on the chair, I said to myself, whom should I invite to learn the most? And so I remembered my experience in Boulder, and I asked Ivo if he would want to come and spend the summer with me. And he came, and we had a very fruitful discussion. We wrote some papers on phase operators yes. at the time. And then I said, gee, you know, this would be nice to continue, and I nominated him for a Humboldt Fellowship and uh, Humboldt Prize, and he came, he got, the, he got the prize, and he came, and we wrote more papers, and then Sophie came, and at that time I was editor of optics communication, like Jan now is editor of this journal, uh, and my wife was handling the office, and at that time papers came in and they were written in the book, and into this book we wrote, you know, who submitted the paper and who is the referee of the paper, when did the paper what, uh, come in, when was it refereed, and all this stuff. And that was all in a book written by hand. And I suddenly said, gee, you know, I'm sure that if it's ref, they don't do it that way. There must be a computer program for this. And then Ivo said, my daughter, she wouldn't know how to do this. She was 15. And so she, we hired her, and she wrote the program for optics communications. And then when I left optics communications, Elsevier bought it. And most offices in Elsevier at that time uh, were working with the program that Iwana wrote. So, as I said, there's a long connection, and now I'm going to go to the talk. And what I want to present here is something that I have done during the last month, but the problem came up years ago, 40 years, more than 40 years ago, when I was with John Wheeler. And you have seen the crucial equations already in Ivo's talk. I was very impressed that he showed the two equations that I want to start the talk with. And it's, the problem is the wave functional of the vacuum. Now what I want to talk about and what's in this special issue here 
is a modification of this problem, the wave functional of a vacuum in a resonator. Now you would say vacuum is vacuum. Well, it's slightly different if you have a resonator and you have boundary conditions on the modes. And of course it depends if these modes are the modes of the electric field, of the magnetic field, or of the vector potential. And so the results will be different depending on which field you have. And of course it's clear why, because you look at the different representation of the vacuum. Now, uh, one problem that I always found fascinating, and it's, it's mentioned, it was mentioned in Ivo's talk today, if you were careful, he had the wave functional shown there in terms of the vector potential, but the vector potential didn't appear. It was the magnetic field that appeared. And of course, in the magnetic field, and it goes back to Wheeler, he also had this already, and the argument is gauge invariance. A is not a gauge invariant quantity, so it shouldn't be there. And I will show you today, there's a deeper reason, and you see this if you work with modes of a resonator. The, mode, the reason is you can have A without the curl, but then you work in a certain mode representation. And if you use a different mode representation, you get the result that Evo had. So this is what I want to show you. So, as I said, I wanted, and this is a, obviously a talk which involves equations, otherwise you will not appreciate this, and that's why I didn't want to show it in terms of PowerPoint. By the way, Kenneth Starr, he died a couple of years ago, he was the guy who prosecuted uh, uh, Clinton. Uh, he was that special prosecutor. He once said in a talk in Texas A&M, he said, PowerPoint. There is no power in PowerPoint, and there is no point in PowerPoint either. <laughs> so, anyways, so the wave functional is an object for, for example, the vector potential, which is a quantity that has some normalization that we don't worry about at the moment, because it is very complicated. Then we have here a fact, and I'm writing down the result of the Anitsky Birola. And it has here yeah, mu zero, I'm saying epsilon zero over mu zero. And now comes a double integral here of the space. And here comes the curl of A times the curl of A. But these have to be evaluated at different coordinates. That's why I put a prime here. And the whole thing is divided by r minus r prime squared. So this is the function. I should rather close the parentheses here. And the crucial equation in deriving this is a relation that you have also seen in Evo's talk. You have seen it in a slightly different way, but it's the same equation. It's the equation e to the i k r is 1 over 2 pi squared, 1 over r squared. So these are the two equations that you have seen. And the key thing is that this expression has a, but on the right hand side it has the curl of a, and it has this r minus r prime squared. Now why are we doing this? What does it mean? What does this quantity mean? Usually, when we do quantization of the radiation field, then we decompose the field, either the E field, the B field, the A field, into modes. And then we quantize every mode as a harmonic oscillator. Now, this procedure here does not refer to modes anymore once it's written down. This is some, is somehow, or something like the wave function of the vacuum in this representation without referring to modes. But of course it is the representation of the vacuum, the ground state of every single oscillator of this mode representation. Now, you can calculate quantities with this, but nevertheless it's a nice one, a result. Ivo has done a lot of work and he mentioned that he has calculated the Wigner function for this quantity. And so I was, as I said, always fascinated by this quantity. But I asked myself, now let's do this for a resonator, where we have boundary conditions, and 
the modes are not plane waves in which there is a simple relation between the integration over the modes, which is the wave vector now, and the frequency. It's a very complicated relation now because it's the boundary conditions that fix the frequency in these resonators. And so what I want to show you is an expression. That's what I'm trying to derive, or at least motivate, that looks very similar to this expression. And it has a, const has a constant here. And then almost the same integral that Evo has. And it is f and of r times the kernel. And I put here emission conjugate to indicate that we don't have a column vector, but rather a row vector that multiplies a matrix. And I shouldn't have, I was so tempted in, in writing it. So here's a kernel times f. And this is now evaluated at r prime. And again, we close this parenthesis. And this f here is either the vector potential, or the electric field, or the magnetic induction. Now the kernel that I have written down is, as I said, a matrix. And the matrix comes by having a function f taking the square root of the Laplacian, acting on a transverse delta function of r minus r prime. And the function f is either x for a, for the vector potential, or it is 1 over x for e and b. So let me get, uh, and this is the main result. That's why I started the talk, so I can at least show you what it is that we did. And when I said we did, uh, it was a graduate student of mine, Alexander Friedrich. It was Daniela Moll, who was a student of mine many years ago. Uh, uh, and then Matthias Freiberger, and uh, Matthias' first paper was with Ivo when he was visiting us, and Lev Klimak. Now, uh, and you find this in the, in the special issue. So what's the difference? What's the similarities in these expressions? Well, you notice that if you would take A here, this would be bilinear in A. It would not like what Ivo and what Wheeler said, bilinear in curl of A. You notice that the K is a matrix. It is not a scalar, as in Ivo's case. It is a matrix. And here you see the kernel is 1 over r squared, which has to do with this relation here. On the other hand, and also you get here a delta function. And you see it can do all three cases if we keep track of this 1 over x and x. And now the question is, where are all this coming from? So let me go back and remind myself in your presence about modes. Now, if we talk about the vacuum in the absence of charges and in the absence of currents, then, of course, we have the wave equation for the electric field. We have the d'Alembert wave equation for the magnetic induction. And if we are in Coulomb gauge, then we are going to be having an equation for A equal to zero. These only rely on the fact that we have no currents and no charges. This one relies on the fact that we also have a gauge condition. Now, usually we expand this in terms of eigenmodes of the Helmholtz equation. So we have something like the Laplacian plus the wave vector acting on the mode function is equal to zero. And then we calculate, and what are the boundary conditions? The boundary conditions are usually set by the electric field at the boundaries. 
So the mode functions here that we use are usually in terms of u. So these mode functions that we use here, so the mode functions of e, are usually used, namely the mode functions that come out of here. Now, we have also boundary conditions on B. And these boundary conditions are usually not nicely done in terms of U, but in a different form of U, namely the mode functions of B are usually, I write them as 1 over KL curl of UL. So these are different mode functions. So you can interpret them, and because this is, of course, a Hamilton Laplace, it's a Hamilton operator. So as a result, first of all, these mode functions are complete, and they have eigenvalues because of the Laplace that are always positive. That's why I can write it here as k squared. And so I have three different mode functions, if you want. Two of them are identical. I have the mode function u. I have the mode function I sometimes call this vl. To just say this is that they're the same, and then I have these mode functions. Now, for this reason, I can expand either A, E, or B in terms of these modes, and I call this FL times the mode function FL of R. And these FL are either the use the V's, which are identical, or these mode functions, depending on which field I use. And these are the fields, individual modes. These are the modes that eventually, these are the up fields that I will eventually quantize. Now, what's important for this analysis and for this result is to understand that since these modes are uh, orthogonal, since they come out of these eigenvalue equation, of course, I, mode functions that correspond to different eigenvalues must be orthogonal. So, we have an orthogonality relation, or I could rather even say an orthonormality relation, FL of R times FL prime of R, delta L prime, and I have a volume here because I want to keep, make sure these are dimensionless mode functions. So all the physics and all the physical quantities sit in the FL, and this is a dimensionless quantity, so if I integrate over it, I will be left with the volume. And this is the volume I'm putting in. And then, of course, and that's the most important part, there exists a completeness relation. And the completeness relation is now over FL, at R, FL star, or F dagger, of R prime, divided by the mode volume, is the transverse delta function of R minus R prime. And this is a matrix, because remember, this is not on the left-hand side, this is on the right-hand side, so this is a row vector, this is a column vector, this is a dyadic product. So this is a matrix. So now you see, you get a glimpse already of where this result is coming from because I can expand this function into these mode functions and the expansion coefficient FL is now 1 over VL V3R prime of FL dagger of R acting on F. That because that I get immediately if I go with F dagger, F, F dagger on this one, I use the orthonormality, I get the coefficient. <coughs> and because the F's are emission, I can also find another representation of this expression, and this would have been F times FL of R prime. Let me put this here. No, this is good. 
F L L R. And this is F dagger L. So these are two representations of the F. Now, third chapter, and I have about five minutes left, I think. Is that true? And so then the next step. Five minutes. <laughs> I would have appreciated if you wouldn't have answered. <laughs> quantization. <laughs> quantization. We are going to take and put the F with an operator. So we're making the FL to operators. And of course, the space part is not influenced. And as a result, what I will get now is, of course, I can define in each mode eigenstates of that operator. As I said, this could be eigenstates of E, of B, of A, and these are the eigenstates. Now, uh, if I want to write down the ground state, this is usually the, this is where we are usually doing this operator, these uh, ground state wave functions. And so if I write down the wave function of the ground state, of that mode, the else mode, in that representation of f, we're going to get a normalization factor and a Gaussian. Nothing surprising. But we have to be careful. The exponential has to be, in its argument, dimensionless. Okay? It has to be dimensionless. And this is why I introduced another f a script f at this point, and this script f has different quantities, has different sizes. So if I would have a, and so I make a small table here, e, and here's b. So if it's a, then of course you remember it's h bar divided by epsilon zero, omega l and the, the mode volume. This is what you set as the vacuum. This is the vacuum strength and the potential, the vacuum the vector potential. You can also, if you now go to the electric field, then the frequency is in the up here. Why? Because in Coulomb gauge, the electric field is minus vector potential, is the time derivative of the vector potential. As a result, you're going to get a frequency involved, and that frequency brings the frequency here into the expo up, upstairs. That's, that's important. So this is AL times omega L. And now you come to the BL, and the BL is essentially EL over C. And this is AL times KL. Now you start to see why I have distinguished here functions x and 1 over x. Why? Because, you see, if I substitute these expressions here into here, I will get a bunch of constants, h bar, epsilon 0, the mode volume. But the notice the frequency is different. Once the frequency here is in the numerator, in these expressions, once I substitute it in here, it will be in the denominator. And that's crucial. And with this, let me just write up how the answer comes about. You're ready there now? Uh, that's it. I should have pushed this further up. Anyways, so the wave functional of all the ground states would be an infinite product of all the psi l's, which would be a new normalization, an exponential of minus one half. These constants that emerge, let me push this up here. Oops. So these constants that h by epsilon zero mode volume and then we have the so-called mode, which I call the mode sum, and that would have 
the FL, and then we have here FL squared times the mode volume. So that's what I get. If I multiply all the Gaussians that you have there, substitute these constants into there, and because the omega appears differently in A, E, and B, I have to be careful here at this point. Now, how do I go from here into get the answer that I have in the center here? How do I get from here? Well, all I have to do is substitute for this expression here, for the FL, for the expansion coefficients, I substitute these representations. And you notice, this is the mode function, that's the function f, and somehow, immediately, I'll see, I just represent that, what I'll get is a new sum of 1 of fl of kl times 1 over the mode volume fl of r, fl of r prime, Dagger. And how do I sum this? This is now what the mode sum is. No, it, it's, it's, and of course there are integrals. But, and then there is f here. And here is f. Okay, so, so the, this expression here has to be calculated. That's the kernel. That's the kernel. So how do I get this, how do I perform this sum? I mean, it's, that's why I said it, I, it, there's a complicated dependence on the frequency of the wave vectors on L, the mode summation. So how do you perform this sum? And there's the mode volume involved and this crazy function. Well, that's very simple. You go back to this very equation up here, where I have the, this expression here. Because the mode function satisfies Laplace plus KL squared times FL equal to zero. So as a result, you can say KL squared times FL is equal to minus the Laplacian of FL of R. And of course I can take now, since these are eigenfunctions of this operator, I can take roots and everything, and then you see this f of kl is nothing else but f of the negative Laplacian to the power one half. And now you're finished. Now you have really seen that because of the completeness relation, I have taken the f out, the rest is the completeness relation, and I arrive at this result. Last remark, how do I get back to Ebo? <coughs> well, the functions that I have used, A, E, and B, are all transverse functions. So this, this delta function here is not needed because it's supposed to take of every function f only the transverse part. But because these functions are already transverse, I can replace this by the delta function, the normal delta function. And when I do the normal delta function, I can apply this f again. I can apply the f again. And where is it? Oh, here it is. This is the formula here. You see? Then if I, because the plane waves are also solutions of the Laplacian, I can redo what I just did with the normal mode functions. I go back into here and I get the result. Last point, how do I get the curl rather than that? And I said I get the curl by expanding the vector potential not in A, but expanding the vector potential in terms of the omegas. Nobody charges me for doing that. And if I do it in the vector potential in A, in, in W, I'll find exactly that expression. Last point to that. This has a very dramatic difference here, this k-dependence. It has the dependence, if I would write this expression here, for A, the kernel 
for A would be 1 over R to the 4, and it would be negative. The kernel for E is 1 over R squared, as we have known from Ewell's work and, and Wheeler's work, and this is KB. So, with this, I hope I haven't taken up too much time. I thank you very much for inviting me, for allowing me to present this work here, as I said, which was really motivated by many discussions I've had with Ivo, and I look forward to questions. Thank you. We probably don't have too much questions, but let, let me first ask the question or the comment. Would it be interesting to formulate uh, uh, this vacuum um, uh, to, to, uh, to formulate this uh, vacuum as a um, Lorentz invariant state? That would certainly be interesting. But I tell you, but I tell you what not I find. Not in the resonance, of course, not in the resonance. It's not in the resonance. Not in the no, resonance. In the, in the original yeah, form. Yeah, let me go back to Ewan's work. But I tell you why I was interested again. Why am I interested? That has more to do with what you're working on, the lamp shift. Okay, I was always fascinated, and of course you, you you wouldn't think that this is that interesting because you've done wonderful calculations to many orders. But I would go back to the Velton picture. And in the old Velton picture, there was a sum of all modes. And once you've done the sum of a mode, you get the beta logarithm. But I always wondered, wouldn't it be possible to use these expressions? Because if they are not in the modes anymore. Okay, so maybe one can just redo this calculation now in this formulism without the modes. Because you have to do the trace over the modes anyways. Anyways, but I, I'll, I'll leave that. I will keep this. Yeah. Thank you for the comment. Uh, short questions. Please. Comparing uh, original wave, uh, well, wave function, uh, you also have electric field and the magnetic field both. So can we actually make completely covariant form of uh, Yes. Expression. Ivo has done all of this. Ivo has done all of this, of course. As I said, the emphasis here was I wanted to really see it with discrete frequencies, not with a continuum. I wanted to really see what it is that I can do in the case of discrete modes. Because of this particular problem back here, where you really have to sum these functions here, and it's not clear because there's a very complicated dependence on the frequency, which is not there in the case of plane waves. Okay. Now, you might say, well, this expression doesn't have modes in it anyway, so why do you worry about it? Well, it is not that simple because once you start taking expectation values of operators, the operators have to be expanded again in modes before you can do this. And so in the end, you would want to have a functional integration that allows you to do operators. And that's for that reason you have to really understand every every mode expansion, every detail that there is. At least I have to. Okay. Thank you very much. Let us thank Volga once again.